Roloff's origins can be traced to a location near St. John, New Brunswick, where he was born to Danish immigrant parents. Notably, his sibling was the accomplished photographer William Roloffson. Roloff's early years were marked by two significant events, before reaching the age of 20, he had already engaged in employment at a law firm and undergone a two-year prison term due to embezzlement charges. In 1842, he relocated to Dryden in upstate New York, assuming the role of a school teacher while concurrently delving into the study of botanical medicine under the guidance of Dr. Henry W. Bull. During the subsequent year, Roloff took a spontaneous step by marrying Harriet Shutt, who happened to be Dr. Bull's 17-year-old cousin. This marriage occurred without the customary courtship rituals and faced opposition from Shutt's family, who held reservations about Roloff's social standing. The couple relocated to Lansing, New York, and their Harriet gave birth to their daughter, Priscilla. Roloff, driven by a desire to distance himself from his wife's family, urged her to move to Ohio. He envisioned a future as a lawyer or college professor there. However, Harriet resisted this idea and threatened to return to her family with their daughter. The tragic events that unfolded on June 22, 1844, saw Roloff accuse Harriet of an affair with Bull and fatally strike her on the head with a pestle. Disturbingly, he also poisoned their daughter, leading to her demise. Subsequently, Roloff contemplated taking his own life, but found himself unable to carry it out. The following day, he borrowed a horse and wagon from his neighbors, the Andersons, ostensibly to return a wooden chest to his uncle. Alongside the chest, Roloff placed a partially filled sack or pillowcase in the wagon, which raised suspicions. He headed toward Cayuga Lake, a direction opposite to his stated destination. Upon his return, still accompanied by the chest, Roloff informed Mrs. Anderson that he and his wife would be away for a couple of weeks. His house was left in a state of disarray. As rumors swirled about Roloff's involvement in his wife's death, he encountered the Shutt family's confrontation. Initially denying any wrongdoing, he concocted stories about his wife's departure and their supposed move to Ohio. These claims were disbelieved due to the discovery of Harriet's belongings in their home, suggesting her departure was not voluntary. Roloff fled once more, pursued by his brother-in-law, Ephraim Shutt. He was eventually apprehended and brought to Ithaca to face trial for murder. Efforts to locate the bodies in Cayuga Lake proved futile. Lacking sufficient evidence to charge Roloff with murder, the grand jury indicted him for kidnapping his wife. In 1846, Roloff conducted his own defense during his trial, emphasizing the absence of substantial evidence of a crime. Despite his efforts, he was convicted and sentenced to 10 years of hard labor at Auburn Prison. During his incarceration, Roloff undertook self-study in philology and developed his own theory of language evolution. He intended to publish this theory under the title The Great Secret in Philology after his release. He even taught students in his cell. However, his aspirations in the field were thwarted by the news that Tompkins County intended to charge him with his wife's murder upon his release. Roloff claimed double jeopardy and initiated a legal battle from his jail cell. The district attorney dropped the murder charge for Harriet Roloff, but replaced it with a charge related to Priscilla's death. Roloff was eventually found guilty of this crime in 1858, but he managed to escape custody before the verdict could be executed. Roloff's escape from captivity was likely aided by Albert Jarvis, the son of Ithaca's undersheriff. Jarvis had been educated in Greek and Latin by Roloff, later becoming his criminal accomplice. Alternatively, assistance might have come from Jarvis's mother, Jane, who had formed a bond with Roloff and publicly expressed doubts about his guilt as a murderer. In any event, Roloff embarked on a solitary westward journey on foot, enduring harsh conditions. He subsisted on foraged wild nuts and stolen farm provisions, but suffered frostbite that cost him two toes. Upon reaching Meadville, Pennsylvania, Roloff adopted the alias James Nelson and approached local inventor A. B. Richmond. 
using his extensive knowledge spanning conchology, mineralogy, forensic anthropology, and entomology, Roloff persuaded Richmond to form a business partnership. A similar display of expertise at Jefferson College in southwestern Pennsylvania nearly secured him a professorship. However, Jarvis contacted Roloff, revealing his family's dire circumstances and pressuring him for assistance. Driven by his obligation, Roloff attempted to rob a jewelry store to aid the Jarvises. Unfortunately, he was apprehended and returned to Ithaca. Remarkably, Roloff, despite being a convicted murderer, fugitive, and now a robber, managed to successfully appeal his murder conviction. He was acquitted and released, with authorities choosing not to prosecute him for other charges. Subsequently, he relocated to New York City alongside Jarvis, and the duo turned to a life of burglary for survival. In 1861, Roloff's criminal path led him to Sing Sing Prison, where he encountered another partner in crime, William T. Dexter. During his time there, Roloff learned about the upcoming inaugural convention of the American Philological Association in Poughkeepsie. Seizing the opportunity, he submitted a manuscript under the alias Professor Yuri Lorio. The manuscript, titled Method in the Formation of Language, presented his theory on language evolution. Roloff aimed to auction the manuscript, commencing at a sum of $500,000. Despite his lofty expectations, the association dismissed his ideas, and none of its members made a bid for the manuscript. Roloff, Jarvis, and Dexter devised their subsequent scheme to rob a dry goods store in Binghamton, New York, during 1870. They selected this target while the live-in clerks, Frederick Merrick and Gilbert Burroughs, were asleep on the upper floor. Employing chloroform to induce slumber, the trio's intention was to ensure the clerks remained unaware of the burglary. However, their efforts went awry when Jarvis accidentally disturbed something, causing the clerks to wake. Merrick, the first to react, tried to shoot Roloff using a concealed firearm under his pillow. Unfortunately for Merrick, the gun malfunctioned and did not fire. Undeterred, he seized a stool and hurled it at the escaping Roloff. Concurrently, Burroughs engaged Dexter in a physical confrontation. Observing the escalating fracas, Jarvis and Roloff intervened on Dexter's behalf, with Roloff firing a shot into the air as a warning. Burroughs ceased his attack, but Merrick persisted in his assault on Jarvis. As the situation escalated further, Roloff fired another warning shot, yet Merrick remained undeterred. In response, Roloff pointed the gun at Merrick's head and discharged it, instantly ending Merrick's life. Amid the ensuing chaos, the thieves attempted a hasty escape. However, their flight became disordered, causing them to miss the boat designated to ferry them across the Chenango River. Faced with this obstacle, they resorted to swimming across the river. Exhaustion and the swift current overcame Jarvis and Dexter, leading to their drowning. Speculation arose after Roloff's later arrest regarding his potential role in their deaths. Their lifeless bodies were discovered the following morning. In contrast, Roloff successfully traversed the river, albeit leaving behind a pair of distinctive leather boots imprinted with a discernible depression corresponding to his absent toes. Prompted by Burroughs' alert, the Binghamton police swiftly organized patrols and apprehended individuals exhibiting suspicious behavior. The subsequent morning witnessed Roloff casting himself into the realm of suspicion. Disregarding a request to provide identification at the local railroad station, he evaded across train tracks, eventually taking refuge in an outhouse on a nearby farm, where he was ultimately captured. Initially identifying himself as Charles Augustus and later as George Williams, Roloff's encounter with the authorities intensified when he was confronted with the lifeless bodies of Dexter and Jarvis, exhibited publicly to facilitate identification. Despite their proximity, Roloff vehemently denied any association with the deceased. However, Roloff's true identity was disclosed by Judge Ransom Balcom, a witness at the scene, who unequivocally declared, You are Edward H. Roloff. You murdered your wife and child in Lansing in 1845. 
Turning to the authorities, Judge Balcom emphasized Roloff's astute comprehension of his legal rights and predicted his steadfast defense. Subsequent investigation yielded documents on Dexter's and Jarvis's persons, leading to a Brooklyn apartment owned by Roloff under the alias Edward C. Howard. Commencing on January 4, 1871, Roloff's trial captured widespread attention, drawing daily crowds of up to 2,000 people. Notable figures, including Horace Greeley, the director of the New York Tribune, advocated for clemency, contending that Roloff's considerable intellectual capacity should spare him from execution, irrespective of his guilt. Roloff, once again self-representing, declined to plead insanity. Instead, he entreated Governor John T. Hoffman for a pardon or, failing that, a postponement of his execution until he could fully develop his theory on language evolution. He asserted that he would be willing to embrace death following this endeavor. Mark Twain contributed a letter to the Tribune, satirically suggesting that he could produce an alternate individual who would admit to Roloff's crime and assume his execution. On March 3, Roloff was found guilty and condemned to hang. During his time on death row, he confessed to the murder of his wife, providing detailed descriptions, yet he steadfastly denied responsibility for his daughter's death. This led to speculation that he had arranged for his daughter to live under an assumed identity with relatives. Roloff's execution took place on May 18, 1871, marking a significant public event. Contrary to some sources indicating that he delivered a speech on the gallows, potentially concluding with the words, hurry it up. I want to be in hell in time for dinner, others suggest his sole utterance was, I can't stand still. Following his execution, his brain was conveyed to Cornell University, where Professor Bert Wilder pronounced it to be the largest on record at that time.